So welcome to uh, this uh, Capital Conference session for Literary Criticism, Poetry Explication. This is part one of a two-part series. Our presenter is Mark Bernier, the State Contest Director and Test Writer. So Mark, thanks for uh, all you do, to uh, your love for this contest and uh, your love for teaching people about it. So uh, look forward today. I always learn a great deal from you about things I should already know probably. So that's my cue. Uh, we have one handout today. The handout is the one we'll use today and for Friday. We will look at it. There are about 15 poems on the handout. And on page eight, the final page of the handout, there is a listing of the terms that at least I think I'm scheduled to bump into as we go through the poems, both today and Friday. Um, to, to keep it active in some way, I'm thinking that um, were any of you to have a poem in mind, one that we've covered before, one we haven't covered, if, if you were to send it to me on that email address, you can find in a number of places on the website and in a couple of the handouts, dieburn at sbcglobal.net. And I'll uh, print that, uh, excuse me, I'll transfer that poem to a handout, get that to Austin, and we'll have it available for Friday, which is to say, uh, if you don't, we'll just work with the poems I've picked. If you do, it is the case that we will look at it uh, and maybe answer some questions. I might not have the right answers, but they're the answers that I will expect to see on a test. So uh, that leads me into my usual qualifier that we are looking at poems in this contest um, in terms of creating avenues toward understanding. I think they're called questions with five options. So we're doing a multiple choice investigation and multiple choice rendering of an understanding of a, a genre that shouldn't get nowhere near multiple choice. So, so I've, I've, I've apologized, I guess, for that. And so we'll move on. Any questions before we begin with this seven page plus the eighth page listing of terms we might encounter? Any questions from anybody? Any voicings you wish to make? You're supposed to count to seven on Zoom, David? Work my team. Okay. We're going to start on page three. I'm going to jump around a little bit, please. I believe his name is pronounced Minky. I'll try not to block my face too much there as I read. And uh, it is Atomic Pantum. Uh, this is um, not performance recital sort of quality, we'll get through the poem, we'll stop every now and then. In a chain reaction, the neutrons release split over other nuclei, which release more neutrons. The neutrons release, blow open some others, which release more neutrons and start this all over. Blow open some others and choirs will crumble and start this all over with eyes burned to ashes and choirs will crumble, fish catch on fire with eyes burned to ashes in a chain reaction. The fish catch on fire because the sun's force in a chain reaction has blazed in our minds. Because the sun's force, the plutonium trigger has blazed in our minds. We're dying to use it. The plutonium trigger curled and tightened. We're dying to use it, torching our enemies. Curled and tightened, blind to the end, torching our enemies. We sing to Jesus, blind to the end, split up like nuclei. We sing to Jesus in a chain reaction. Uh, one of the things that your uh, lit critters should be ready to do is identify closed form poetry. Uh, closed form, in contrast to open form, open form we might recognize in terms of free verse, no rhyme, no rhythm. This is a particular form borrowed from another culture and rendered in English and the enjoyment there has a lot to do with the repetition of lines. Uh, what we can look at as we see our first poem today and not spend a lot of time on it is there is no punctuation. What you can talk about with your lit critters is that poetry is both visual and oral. It's on the page and that's an important aspect of it. And it's to be heard, to be heard by virtue of uh, recitation or simply uh, uh, your mind's voice reading it on the page. And we used to laugh at people. You can pick that up in the novels, but it used to be that people read and moved their lips 
which is uh, probably an advantage. Uh, you catch yourself doing that. I tell my students that you should not study with gum in your mouth. You come across a word you want to remember, you're going to have a tendency to mouth that word, to lift that word, and the fine motor action associated with remembering, repeating it five times, let's say, and your mouth, your lips, your upper laryngeal tract, all that moving, that helps remember. Language is a very physical aspect of our communicate, communicative uh, endeavor. And so we have here, um, a poem form meant to be heard and meant to be read on the page and no punctuation suggests something toward the theme or at least the subject of this particular poem, chain reaction, this atomic pantomime wherein there's a repetition of lines throughout the poem. There's not much to say other than to get started on this poem. Uh, and excuse me, what we're doing with explication, starting with, I don't want to call it a simple one, but the interlocking quatrains, uh, take a note of that, uh, reaction and, uh, and um, excuse me, and then, then the poem, uh, I lost it, the, the second and fourth lines of the first stanza are repeated as the first and third lines of the next quatrain, the next stanza, and that walks all the way through this chain reaction as associated with atomic, atomic uh, reactions as we know it, and as, uh, as our, our STEM fellows know it and gals know it awfully well. We can uh, point out words uh, as we have on line 13, crumble, which is onomatopoeia. Uh, we, we have imagery, fish catch on fire with the alliteration. We can notice the um, paradox at least it's a borderline satirical paradox as we, we are dying to use it. Uh, there, there's something about, uh, there's a commentary here that dives deep into our failing to recognize that we are the cause of most of our problems. And so we create this, this chain reaction and we wanna use it. And in using it, we are setting ourselves up for its use by others. So the, what I've spotted in here, these are run on lines. What I need to have you, especially the newbies to the contest, uh, we work with the handbook, the Harmon handbook, the Holman Harmon handbook, and they make the classical distinction uh, between enjambment and run on lines. A run on line occurs within a stanza. These stanzas are quatrains. And in a case of enjambment, en jambon, in uh, uh, West Texas, where David Hale's from, uh, they pronounce everything French. Uh, the the, the, the run-onness, if you will, goes from one stanza to the next stanza. So we do have both run-ons and enjambment, uh, in part because uh, the poet has chosen to emphasize the chain reaction by avoiding any kind of in-stop indicator, such as a question mark or a period or an exclamation point. Um, and then the, the, the main thing here, as we introduce ourselves to what we're doing today, the form of the poem reinforces the subject matter, which is not to say it doesn't reinforce the theme. If, if things keep happening and what Einstein say, and we expect different results from the same input, um, maybe we need to uh, have it repeated and interlocked so that we understand. So here's a poem I could put on the page. I could speak to in terms of questions. What is its form? The answer is pantum. Uh, I offer an example. Mark, you were asking for examples. Here's an example in a question of this move from one stanza to the next. The answer would be en jambon, enjambment. And then uh, the, the moving from one line to another within each of the stanzas run on lines. And then there would, might be something, a question I could ask about onomatopoeia and about um, the paradox that seems to be at work here, if not paradox uh, in a classic sense, at least irony, we're dying to try it. That's all I have to say at this point. Any questions about this point? Okay, page one, the second page, the second, Poem on that page, Lilith Millen Yunyard's 
lullaby in Fracktown. I believe I used this on a test some time back, probably in part four. Uh, what we have is, let me get my notes out so I don't skip anything. First time I've used notes, sort of thing I've got to do these days. We have another closed form. Anybody recognize what this closed form is? Angie, impress everybody. We have a villanelle. There we <laughs> Sorry, are. I was doing something else simultaneously. That's all right, but your, your, <laughs> your picture's up here. Now I got David looking at it, so I'll ask him next time. <laughs> um, we, we've got a villanelle. We have uh, these three line stanzas, these tercets. There's repetition within them and among them. And the last uh, stanza is four lines. We can do the math there, three, six, nine, 12, 15. 18 plus one, the Villanelle, again, borrowed into the Anglophone world from the French, a 19 line poem with repetition, different kinds of repetition. Our first word tells us this is an apostrophe. The speaker or the persona here, I think it's a speaker, but we might have a persona. I make that differentiation. Wordsworth, for example, hits always the speaker. He is the one in his poems. If a persona is adopted, that is not unlike Willa Cather in Old Pioneers, a rather long novel, not a poem, but she is the author, a woman, and her persona is a young boy, 19 if I remember, and uh, is that Antonia? It matters, not the example sustains. Uh, she has adopted a, um, a persona, and if there's a clear distinction, especially if we're working with a poet in part two's reading list, and we need to know whether or not this is a personal lyric expression of the poet himself, or if indeed he has a dog talking, certainly that's a persona or someone else. Uh, um, uh, we can go all the way back to Plato and we're in his, um, his, um, his apologies in his, um, in his um, help me here, his, um, what are those things called? Uh, his monologues, excuse me. Uh, he has Socrates talking. So his Socrates is not saying that he's adopted a persona. Thus, we don't know much about what Socrates had to say. So I'll do this again, uh, if you give me leave. Child, when you're sad, put on your blue shoes. You know that mama loves you lollipops and daddy still has a job to lose. So put on a party hat. We'll play the kazoos loud and louder from the mountaintop. Child, when you're sad, put on your blue shoes and dance the polka with pink kangaroos, dolphin choir singing flip-flop, flip-flop. Hey, daddy still has a job to lose. Don't be afraid. Close your eyes, snooze, because today our sons have flared and dropped. Tomorrow when you awake, put on your blue shoes. Eat a good breakfast, be good in school. Good boys go to college, goody gumdrops. So someday too, you'll have a job to lose. Waste trucks clatter by as the gray bird coos. Flames pour forth when the faucet's unstopped. Child, when you're sad, put on your blue shoes. For now, daddy still has a job to lose. I have a lot working in this poem other than commentary. And I guess one-sided commentary. We've spoken about the form of the poem of Villanelle and that it is an apostrophe, which shows up once again in the repetition line six, and then again, line 18, speaking to the child. An apostrophe is when the speaker or the persona in the poem speaks to something he or she does not expect an answer from. Uh, most of us uh, are, are engaged in apostrophe in the classroom. Our students don't come back to us all that often or often enough. So, but when Wordsworth speaks to a daffodil, that's an apostrophe. When one of the later romantics starts talking to the clouds, or here in this case, when this speaker, this persona, the speaker speaks to her child, you get a sense that uh, the child is simply listening. It might even be a dramatic monologue of some sort, uh, warming up to tell the child that the future is a bit um, uncertain. You might have a job someday to lose. A uh, question there might come in terms of tone. Let's look at line, um, Five, loud and louder. The tendency there might be to call that polypton. That's on page eight. There are three tropes, plosi, P-L-O-C-E, polypton, 
and one that I've not found a poem for before. And I'm happy to have found a poem, not that I am going to use it ever. It's just that rare in the English language, I guess. And I just lost my page eight. There it is. And the first column on page eight, you see the third uh, bracketing there, uh, Anna, Anna Cal Cal Anacolis, that's what it is. And Anta, don't ask me to pronounce it, so I won't. A-N-T-A-N-A-C-L-A-S-I-S. Antinoclasis, there you go, antinoclasis. Antinoclasis, let's look at that in a minute in a different poem, but these three tropes, these three figures of speech, mainly tropes, they look at words that are repeated in some manner. In terms of loud and louder, that's not a word being repeated. These are adjectives and one is moving to another degree of comparison and that's not a clean example of plosi or polypteton or anything other than simply the word being used again. I'm confusing the issue by pointing out a non-example. Just because a word is repeated or a word is repeated with a different form of the initial word, the root in this case, does not make it plosi or polypeton. The context is all, to paraphrase King Lear. Um, questions on that, please. Okay, onomatopoeia throughout. So we have um, flip-flop with the, with the dolphins singing. We got snooze. We have words throughout uh, the line 16. We have coos and to recognize the onomatopoeia, which is a element of melopoeia, which is a grouping of terms and that words on page eight, a grouping of terms that have to do with the aural the auditory aspect of the poetry where we have words that sound alike, sound similar, where the words are used in some way to convey meaning as they are in onomatopoeia. And we have onomatopoeia throughout this poem. So it also, we have imagery in the flip-flop, flip-flop. So I might have a question that ask you, ask your uh, lit critter, what kind of imagery uh, uh, moves the consideration in this point forward. And if you're not working closely with what flip-flop is, it's not only auditory, it is visual. So be aware that auditory imagery can be visual. And I believe on page eight, I have those five uh, types of imagery that I often refer to auditory, gustatory, which is taste, olfactory or olfaction, tactile and visual. Uh, a single word in its being an example of onomatopoeia does not mean it is simply one kind of imagery. Uh, these damn poets, they'll mix their kinds of things up. What would have synesthesia, right? Where we mix one aspect uh, in terms of our psychological reception through our senses, where uh, some people, well, I had a student who heard me and when I spoke, she sensed the color orange. And uh, I lived with it. Certainly she had to live with it, but we use it all the time. It's in here with blues. Blues is a color, but it has to do with a mood. So this jumping from one aspect of a psychological awareness of something through our senses, from the visual to the auditory, from the tactile to the auditory, these sort of things are combined. This is not a synesthesia, but it is auditory and visual imagery flip-flop when we speak about the dolphins. And I'll take you to something that's, I, I will find opportunity to look at this one, uh, find it in any poem I come across and I love it. The best examples in the Harmon, it's Byron's use of heteromorous rhyme, often called mosaic rhyme, where we have maybe three or four words strung together to rhyme with a longer word in a different line. In this case, I want you to look please at line seven. It ends with, we talk about visual imagery, pink kangaroos. 
and let's look to see what it rhymes with. A job to lose. We look at kangaroos or syllables, counting three. We look at line nine, which immediately rhymes with kangaroos, and it's three words to rhyme with the one. That is example of heteromerous rhyme or also called mosaic rhyme. Anybody else see anything in the, in the um, poem here? He or she wishes to speak about or ask a question about Darren. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. One, one, this is um, line 13. Is that what you had? Yeah, Darren, again. Or do you have it in front of you, David? Darren's question refers to what line? 13. 13. Eat a good breakfast, be good in school. But I saw something else on the chat box. David, do I have access to the chat box? What would line 13 be? The rhyme scheme with the OO without the F. Oh, got it, got it, got it, got it, got it. Um, I think we have to ignore, we can't. Uh, it's one of those, I didn't notice that. Thank you, Darren. Um, there is a type of rhyme and I cannot pull it off the top of my head if I can mix figures there, the, where you have, trying to think of an example, where you have the word inverted and it rhymes with the next word. And I'm thinking cup, but that doesn't work, P-U-C. Puck, yeah, there you go. Puck for the hockey ring. So uh, I don't think that's what's happening here, but that might be what he would say he would be doing, or she, excuse me, uh, that school and lose, if you pronounce school backwards, you have lose or something, but uh, there's nothing definitive there. It's 21st century poetry and we call it license, but no, there's no name for it other than the referencing to that backwards rhyming, which I don't think is happening here. Thank you, Darren. Circle, circle. Anything else on this particular poem? I, I will I will say something about blue shoes and uh, shoes associated with the journey and the journey being your life. And uh, I think thematically she's pointing to the difficulty that might have, uh, what one might have if one is in the fossil fuels or something like that. And the sun, you too will have a job to lose as as things start to change in our world. So not synesthesia, but cultural symbol associated with color. Uh, blue is not the happiest uh, in this context. Let's go to February afternoon at the top of this page. Um, stumbled across this poem a few years ago, didn't do anything with it. And here it is. And this sonnet, is replete with, I think I could pull almost 30 questions out of this point, which is why I didn't start with this one. It is a sonnet, 14 lines. What kind of sonnet would be a question? Well, we look at the rhyme scheme and what we have here is A, B, B, A, and that becomes with a little bit of consonants now, now and call, not quite rhyming, consonants where the, uh, the uh, consonant sounds rhyme, but the vowel qualities don't. We have a four line quatrain known as, a, as, a, as an envelope or a um, enclosed rhyme, an envelope stanza or a closed rhyme. Both terms used to be in the harmon, only one of them is there now in closed rhyme. And we see that quatrain formulation repeated, law and shaw. And then it jumps to a new rhyming scheme. So what we have immediately recognizable is an octave followed by a sestet. Thus it's baseline Italian. We check to see if it's an Italian by looking at the sestet, the last six lines. If there are no 
couplets, then it's an Italian. The argument can be made that lines 10 and 11 rhyme. The Italian language, Petrarch's Tuscan, the Italian language with all its many vowels eschews a rhyme at this point. English, even after we brought in the Frenchies there in the 11th century, uh, does have rhymes, but not as many opportunities. So in the clear Italian sonnet, there are no rhymes. This one has a rhyme. So my question would be a little bit uh, Weasley or something. Which sonnet form does this poem most fit? Something a little bit more um, uh, intellectual than that. So it comes close to being an Italian. Now, another aspect of the Italian sonnet is the volta. The volta is a turn. And the turn most often in Italian poetry, Italian sonnets, it occurs at the ninth line. It's no guarantee. Often in a Shakespearean or an Elizabethan sonnet, an English sonnet, it shows up as the first word in the final couplet. The Elizabethan, the English sonnet, the Shakespearean sonnet, quatrain, quatrain, quatrain couplet, 14 lines. The Italian sonnet, octave and sestet, 14 lines, oft times in the English sonnet. The turn shows up in the couplet. In the Italian sonnet, it shows up in the sestet. What we have here is a shift. Line nine, time swims before me. It's not a turn that's indicated by the telltale words in English, yet, but, thus, but there is a turn and it probably wouldn't happen in the first part of a season, but by region or by, uh, by state. And especially if this poem is written by the author of the poems that we selected uh, for part two, we should recognize that this is a turn. Uh, we shift from something, uh, the imagery is very, very physical. We're working with starlings, we're working with rooks, we're working with gulls. By the way, you got any gulls out there in Sonora every now and then? So there are, yeah, you do. Yeah, uh, there are no seagulls. They're just gulls that hang around the sea. The rest of the gulls are hanging around um, Angelo and that, that reservoir. Um, so, so we have physical references in the first eight lines in the sestet, we start to get metaphoric. We almost wanna call time swimming personification. Hang on to that one. I think we are not personifying time. I think it's not unlike, to use an example of Lytotus, it's not unlike your linking verbs. Your linking verbs, am, is, are, was, were, be, being, been, are active voice linking verbs, but you also have passive linking verbs. Seems, appears, becomes. It's the, the linking's going on in our mind. The linking is going on in the speaker's mind here. So time is not swimming, time is being perceived as swimming. So this is a metaphorical image, not personification with time. So while I'm talking sonnets in general, this sonnet has two stanzas, an octave and a sestet. A sonnet is, I won't say never because, well, you never say never, it's sort of never, never. But a English language, it's gonna be an English form sonnet, quatrain, 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 couplet has four stanzas. That's important to recognize if I ask that question, but it's also important to recognize if there's a case of run on or enjambment. If there is, and there is not here because line nine starts a new sentence, there's in stop with Shaw, the, there is no enjambment because there is no running on from line eight to nine. If there were a running on from line eight to nine, even though there's not a visual break on the page, this sonnet is a two stanza sonnet. And if there were no in stop at the end of line eight, moving to line nine, that'd be a case of enjambment. Back to my notes. Um, 
The rhyme scheme, uh, we've already talked about that in terms of the in, in, in envelope stanza or the uh, enclosed rhyme. We have um, pretty close rhyming all the way through, uh, with, uh, but um, we, we might start to see that um, uh, there's a variance there enough with the vowel qualities uh, that we call it consonants. All right, um, there is an iambic pentameter quality to it. We teach our students that sonnets are iambic uh, pentameter. This one is baseline iambic, but again, 21st century, leave me alone. I'm not gonna follow all the rules. Uh, so we have to find a line like uh, uh, line number six, I believe it is, which was of old when one like me dreamed how. You can find some good strong iambic, but do not depend on iambic pentameter to be the, the telltale aspect of determining this is a sonnet or not a sonnet. We have visual and auditory imagery all the way through associated with the onomatopoeia. Hello, Doris. Uh, I don't know what that is. is that, oh, I see, that's coming through from my daughter's never workplace. All right, excuse me on that one. So we have onomatopoeia associated with the birds calling, the call, and as you've all, we already pointed out before, but what we wanna look at with the, with the birds also are two words. One of them is in the uh, fifth line commands and in the first line parleying. We can argue that to be personification. Birds don't command, though I, from what we know about Crows, who knows? They they lie. They must command. And starlings with the with the parleying. Uh, we does anybody know the onomatopoeic term for a large flock of starlings that echoes this use of parleying? A large flock of birds, especially cessation. Oh, nice one. No, let's go onomatopoeia though. Darn. <laughs> murmur. So uh, I think I think our friend Edward Thomas is playing off that a little bit. But while we're looking at parleying starlings and doing the iambic pentameter, let's do a syllable count on that first line. We find out that parleying is a two syllable word if we're going to try to make it fit the iambic pentameter. And thus we have an occasion of, let me see if I can pronounce it right, the homeoteliotune. Homeoteleoton, excuse me. We're in the ending of the words in succession is repeated. The L-I-N-G in parleying and starlings, S ignored. So uh, I don't think I ever asked that question, but there it exists. It's a potential question there. Anybody Can you have tell anything? us that term? I'm sorry. Can you yeah, say it's that on page, again? That page eight, H O M E O T E L. Did I leave it off? I can do that. I sure did. I'm spelling it for you, Angie. You ready? H O M E O T E L E U T O N. Let me tell you, Tim. Um, uh, I think they've, I can't remember something about Holy Family. Can't think of the third word, but we eschew this this ending, ending, ending the same uh, in a row. It just doesn't ring true, nice in the English language in terms of our cultural inheritance. And here it sits. Uh, thank you for pointing that. I left that off. I was just afraid I wasn't seeing it. Well, that that can be a worry at my age. I don't think yours. Anyway, <laughs> so on we go. On we go. Any questions on that particular aspect of? of his um, addressing poetically with every rhetorical device he can find, every literary term. Okay. All right. Um, onomatopoeia, personification, consonants. Uh, there's a consonants linearity I see in this thing. And this is for something that uh, one of your students, especially heading off to sing in New York or something like that might've picked up. Oh, we've got on the line, um, I didn't put the lines. There's a first 
No, in the first line, there's the word last. That's not right. There's a word first in line five. And then the word last appears. Anybody see that? I didn't make my notes good. It's right, right in front, front of it. That. Commands that last are first. Yeah, again. yeah, but then it shows up again. Oh, I see. So in line four, there's first or last, and then last or first. And then rhyming with that, if you give me a chance to rhyme school with choose or whatever it was, uh, dust. And if we work at the sequence here of what thematically, and we have not read through this, I think we need to read through it now. Uh, this is about war. If we're talking about first and last and dust, there's a sequence there of rhyming, not unlike in the linear sort of way. Uh, do we remember Emily Dickinson's His Notice Sudden Is? Emily Dickinson is speaking about a snake and she runs a hissing sound through her line, His Notice Sudden Is something like that, and it sounds like a snake. And I think through this sonnet on war, we have that going on with those three words, first, last, last, first, dust. So I will read. Men heard this roar of parleying starlings, saw a thousand years ago, even as now. Black rooks with white gulls following the plow so that the first or last, until a caw commands that last or first again. A law which was of old when one, like me, dreamed how a thousand years might dust lie on his brow, yet thus would birds do between hedge and shaw. Time swims before me, making as a day a thousand years, while the broad plowland oak roars mill-like and men strike and bear the stroke of war as ever, audacious or resigned, and God still sits aloft in the array that we have wrought him, stone deaf and stone blind. So now I walk through it line by line. Men heard this roar, onomatopoeia, a parling starlings, homeoteleton and personification. Parling uh, coming out of the French and into the English is always a sense of maybe there's a treaty, maybe there's an agreement, something might good come of this. Saw, and I've already indicated the starlings are always like a school of fish moving as one. Saw a thousand years ago, even as now. And throughout the poem, throughout this sonnet, uh, this topical evidence of men not changing, even as now, and letter, even as ever, a little bit later on in the poem. Black rooks, uh, I think that, uh, that uh, tragedy, that drama that we're working with this season, where we, we, we have Lady Macbeth looking up at the castle and she sees the swallows and she sees the dark birds, the rooks, the crow-like birds. And they've got the contrast between good and evil right there. The black rooks with the white gulls following the plow. Uh, the plow um, indicate, indicative of, uh, Gerard Miley Hopkins reminds us of this. This is how we can recognize the natural world having been changed by man. He's plowed the fields and here are the birds flying behind. And these are scavenger birds plowing, following the plow so that the first or last until a call commands that the last or first again in this plow, this disruption of the natural world. Oh, and then we have with first or last and last or first is a very minor example of, and I open that up to, to an answer from anybody. First or last, last or first. I'll take one of two answers. I'll take any answer. One, it's a paradox of sorts. How can first be last and last be first? But it's in the form of chiasmus. C-H-I-A-S-M-U-S. -I, -I, I believe I do have it on page eight. That chiasmus coming from the Greek uh, uh, associated with the letter X. So that first crosses over in the second line there from line four to line five. First is on the other side of R and then uh, there's a reverse order with last there. So there's a very brief example of chiasmus along with the paradox. A law which of old when one like me, and we have a simile. Let's talk about similes for a minute. Here we have a simile in line seven there, I believe it is six there, like me, but we also have a simile in line 11. 
roars mill-like. What I want to remind you as coaches to remind your big critters, we often reduce the examples of simile to two indicators like and as. Please, please remember that like, as, than, resembles, the passive voice seems, these are all similes. And in the construction we find in line 11, mill-like is just an inverted form of like a mill. That is a simile. All right. So if you have a student named Bob and he does something and someone else does the same, that was a Bob-like action. So, so watch out for those similes. Sim, uh, not just like and as, but also than, resembles, oh, excuse me, unlike. Unlike is a simile if you use unlike. So which of old when one like me dreamed how a thousand years might dust lie on his brow? What the, what we have encountered here is inversion. Inversion is the reordering of a line of poetry in order to accommodate either or both the meter, call it the rhythm of the line and the rhyme scheme of the stanza or poem. So we wanna make sure that brow ends up on the on the end of the line there, and in some manner work with those monosyllabic words to end up with something close to iambic pentameter, and we've inverted the, the order of the words out of usual sort of uh, 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 colloquialisms, uh, colloquial talk, excuse me. Dust lie on his brow yet. Now, this yet thus, our tendency would to say that's the Volta. But I don't think that occurs here. I think this is just his way of finding, especially these World War I poets, and we'll do one Friday, Arms and the Boy. Um, the World War I poets tried to echo the, the, the world at a tilt. Everything was out of tilt. And they would take, and they did take, and we see it here to some degree, the expectations and throw them out a little bit. It's subversive to a degree. Yet, and thus in repetitive order here, suggests to me not a term in the structure of the poem, a sonnet often being logical, whether it's talking about love or not, the logical sequencing of an argument, this yet thus is not a, um, a, uh, a move from, let's say, uh, from premises to a conclusion like you might have in the syllogism. That occurs as we've already uh, spoken, with time swims. Yet thus were it would birds do between hedge and shaw. Well, I went and looked up shaw, knowing it wasn't Rick Shaw. Anybody? Anyway, uh, uh, Hardy speaks of this in Darkling Thrush. He speaks of a copse, copse C-O-P-S-E. A shaw is a small wooded tree area. What do you call it? Uh, it's not the hundred acre wood, it's a half acre wood. So a shaw is a natural collection of trees. A hedge is man-made by definition. So the birds are caught between the man-made, or here in this case, between the natural and the man-made. Time swims before me making as a day uh, a thousand years. Making as a day, here we have a simile, as a day. While the broad plowland oak roars, mill-like, I think this is a conflation of any number of things, including the sounds of war, the sounds of a tree going through a mill, the water turning that mill paddle affair, just the roar of nature being uh, denatured by a mill. All these sounds here, which he has been building on in the auditory imagery from the beginning with the parling starlings, not unlike Lady Macbeth looking up at the castle and seeing things looking nice because she sees the swallows and knowing, excuse me, Banquo looks up and sees the, uh, sees the swallows, not knowing Lady Macbeth is in there doing the rookie thing, um, which I guess it makes sense because that castle, rook, never mind, that's all chess talk. Time swims before me, making us as a day a thousand years while the broad plow and oak roars mill-like and men strike and bear the stroke. Men strike and bear the stroke. First thing you see is and repeated. This is not polysyndeton. Polysyndeton is the 
introduction of extra conjunctions and 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 off times to complete a line of iambic pentameter maybe. But here I think if you look at the construction, roars mill like and men strike. If we had a comma there after mill like, it would show us that we have two different clauses. Roars mill like and then men strike and bear. We have a compound verb there, compound predicate. So while I've already spoken about don't just jump on loud and louder as polyptoton, don't jump on this as polysyndeton. The poly, the many uses of conjunctions, simple conjunctions in a line, these are indeed the many uses of con simple conjunctions, but it's not simply to add a syllable, okay? So roars mill like and men strike and bear the stroke, strike and stroke. Words based on the same root word, like strong and strength, this is polypotent. This is the repetition of a word in a different form, not a different case, not a different uh, part of speech, but words from the same word. These are different tenses, but in the strong verb heritage we have from the Anglo-Saxon, the, uh, the low German, this is an example of polypotent. P-O-L-Y, a bunch of P's and a bunch of T's, polypotent. And men strike and bear the stroke of war as ever. That goes back to line two, as now. This thing doesn't change. Audacious or resigned. And the, the tradition of the couplet here, and this is a um, toward an English sonnet, uh, and God still sees, did I say that? This is not toward an English sonnet. This is an Italian sonnet. It has the turn. Um, and God still sits, still sits aloft in the array. We have still and sits. That's baseline alliteration but a word that's been dropped out of the handbook, this is sigmatism, where we have the trailing S in sits, also contributing to the repetition of sibilant sounds. So still sits aloft in the array that we have wrought him. And I think our Judeo-Christian heritage and Islamic heritage, what we have is God wroughts, that is God makes. And here we have an inverted we have subversion. We have it that war has wrought upon God and made him stone deaf and stone blind. And he, in this anthropomorphic per, uh, personification of the natural world, where the starlings and the rooks and, 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 and the gulls and everything else, visual imagery, auditory imagery, and God is deaf and blind to it all because it is echoed as now and as ever. Uh, uh, deeply as the World War I poets, not only the English, the German also, English, uh, British, uh, World War I poets, having learned to, to, uh, to uh, sing out, as it were, against war. And here we have God's not listening because we've made him deaf. God's not paying attention because we've made him stone blind. We have wrought him this way. Check my notes, um, see if I missed anything. Okay, Darren, got any questions? Okay, so this is, this is a poem replete with things going on, but it's also the kind of poem I look for so that I can put it on the page and ask maybe three or four questions. Darren, go ahead. Let's nine ten. We're making nine. Okay. 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 Good, Kevin. Um, Darren, I think you said line nine times once before me making as a day, and I don't have that in front of me. David, Kevin jumped in. Um, yes. Would uh, nine and ten making as a day a thousand years be considered a classical biblical illusion? Uh, it, it is. It is. It is. In, in I. I will argue yes, in that we get to the uh, get to the reference to the deity in the couplet at the end. I would just call that embedded illusion, which are some of the best. Uh, uh, 
the argument would be that it's not a religious, it's a cultural bit that's sourced in the, in, the, in the biblical tradition. So yes, I think we could call that easily an embedded illusion. But it speaks more to, well, I don't know if it speaks more to it or not. Uh, I think it's equal. Uh, the man's bringing to the beauty of creation with the parleying starlings flying in the fullness of teamwork, if you will. And then we have the plowing of the earth, creating an advantage for the scavengers in the rooks and in the gulls. And uh, might as well be that we've wiped out the entirety of creation, which as a day or a thousand years, it's a, it, yeah, it's, yeah, I think it's more than embedded illusion. Very good one. Thank you. All right. Find another poem. Uh, let's look in the bottom of three, since we're almost there. Page three. And just look at the haiku in the Sinru. My first year at this, I got in a lot of trouble at state. I um, put a question about a Sinru on there. And uh, no, that was region. That was region. When they got the state, they had a Hawthorne quotable passage uh, where they had uh, found a way to excerpt it as a Sinru. Uh, because I put on the page a 17 line affair, excuse me, a 17 syllable affair. And everybody just jumped on haiku as the answer. And here's the difference between a haiku and a sinru. A haiku, by tradition, coming out of a tradition other than our anglophone, uh, addresses the beauty of nature in terms of the seasons, usually. So it's a natural world, the auditory, the visual, the color, and oftentimes in terms of season or seasonal change. The Sinru has something else at work. It could be ironic, it could be satirical, but it avoids the beauty of nature. Same form as it translates, it translates, translates, transforms into the English. So an example of haiku, a leaf spirals in the summer wind, his goodbye letter. Uh, just really nice. And then the Sinru play on words, Mental pause, the men suck in their guts as a blonde walks by. We got the five, we got the seven syllables, we got the five syllables. Uh, you could argue maybe she's not a natural blonde, thus it's a sinru. No, I'm kidding there. But uh, the haiku is nature. The sinru has a dark side man observation, usually of himself as, as something not fitting into nature. So just because it pops up on a test as a three line, 17 syllable poetic form does not make it a haiku. And while we're doing that sort of thing, let's look on page four, just kind of a breather here with a minute or so to go. Uh, Amanda Green, uh, I wish we were doing a new handbook someday. I'd love to have Amanda Green in there. Amanda Green comes from a mishearing of a of a lyric in a Scottish ballad. And here are just some uh, things that uh, people hear differently than what they really are. Catch one in the eye, the lady ate shallots, bathroom on the right, all those sorts of things. I think we have time for one more poem and a bunch of questions depending on, let's do two poems. On page two, the blue animals, Page two, the blue animals. I don't think I could put this on the test as a uh, poem in part three. It would probably end up in part four. When I awoke this morning, they were there, just as blue as the morning, as calm as the long green lawn they grazed upon, turning their delicate heads. You would have said, no harm shall befall us, but you were gone. So these two opened my morning gracefully wide and blue in morning as the morning sky, their calm mouths moved over the lawn. And as I was turning to call out again to you, I saw that there was no harm at all, though you were gone. 
Note that line one rhymes with line five, or rhymes with line nine, rhymes with line 13. Line two rhymes with line six, rhymes with line 10, and rhymes with line whatever it is, 13, 14, and all the way through. Uh, the blue annals, who knows what those are? You know, I, 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 jelly tubbies, I don't know. But, but what we have is an apostrophe, and as much as the blue animals were or weren't there, she was there or not there, there's a lot to be done with that. And it's driven, I think, in part by the stanza development, or the development of the poem across the stanzas which echo each other. It's accentual. I think you'll see that each line has a certain number of acts, excuse me, syllables. I didn't say syllabic accentual. The number of syllables are echoed all the way through, I believe. And, and um, no guarantees that, that it is open form. There's a, an attempt to somehow reinforce the subject matter and the theme by kind of a novel way of rhyming. All right. Um, the, there is a curiosity here, and I'll, I'll bring it out in this particular discussion. There's a exchange here, and one could, in a tie-breaking argument, uh, make note of that each of the beginning lines ends with a feminine rhyme, sometimes called double rhyme, morning, turning, morning, turning. And the others are masculine. I would go so far as to say that the morning and the turning, the turning, there's certitude, and in the balance of the lines, the other 12 lines, there's not so much certitude, whether we're talking about whether the blue animals exist, whether she's actually there, whether each of them is protecting one or the other or calming one or the other. So maybe there's strength in the feminine and not so much in the masculine as we see it echoed on the page. Okay, um, one more point, line five, please. I mean, page five, thank you. The true story of Snow White. This is subversion. Almost before the princess had grown cold upon the floor beside the bitten fruit, the queen gave orders to her men to shoot the dwarfs and thereby clinch the iron hold upon the state. Her mirror learned to lie and no one dared speak ill of her for fear she might through her devices over here. So in this manner, many years passed and now today, not even children weep when someone whispers how for her beauty's sake, a child was harried once into a grove and doomed because her heart was full of love to lie forever in an unlovely sleep, which not a prince on earth has power to break. Not quite the Snow White. Well, this is the true story of Snow White, apparently. And what I've noted as questions that I could ask include the last line, wherein we have syncope. It's not spelled P-O-W apostrophe R. It's spelled P-O-W-E-R, but it's pronounced as if we drop the syllable to ensure that there are 10 syllables in the line has power to break. It's there, but at 20th century, they chose, he chose, Brent chose not to do the apostrophe as we have in Elysian and Syncope. Let's look at the rhyme scheme. We got cold, fruit, shoot, hold. What we have are the quatrains, the envelope stanzas. But I think we need to note that um, there is a volta in line nine. And so, and now today it's a temporal, not a logical, but a temporal. It has to do with the progression of the story. So it's a temporal volta there in line nine. I find it, and I might be way off base here, Mr. Bennett's not here, so I get to say something. Uh, we look at line two, upon the floor beside the bitten fruit, I see something wonderfully Anglo-Saxon. I see the alliterative line with the B and the B, and then the the, which is not close, but English works with that, that dental, that avelier dental differently, but you have beside 
and bitten, but you also have the teas and fruit and teas and bitten and floor and fruit. You've got all kinds of alliteration, which I think makes solid the archaic notion out of which a myth or a fable or a legend or a fairy tale might develop. And then we get to the end and say, no, that's not it. You, you know, you've left a, a girl to sleep forever because there's nobody gonna, gonna wake her up kind of thing if we're gonna be realistic about it. So I think in the word choice by way of alliteration, we've made sure we've progressed in this subversion of a, of a fairy tale. Uh, well, fairy tales, Hollywood, I mean, Disney subverted most of them. Most of them are pretty gruesome. Um, but we move from line two all the way through. The um, mirror learning, I don't know if that, if we wanna call that personification or reification, I think there's more going on there. The mirror is a reflection of her. It's metatomic. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on there that I would never ask about. I think there's metonymy, metaphor, and some kind of reification going on. Uh, and that's, that's what's called, and it's not in the list, um, Angie, transumption, T-R-A-N-S-U-M-P-T-I-O-N. It's when you take several tropes and pile them on one another. And I think this mirror, learning to lie, is transumption. T-R-A-N-S-U-M-P-T-I-O-N. You have onomatopoeia showing up and sigmatism, alliteration. You have I rhyme with grove and love. So there are any number of aspects of this sonnet that I can ask about, or we could end up uh, using it in part four, looking at uh, uh, what, what the uh, title purports that this is really the story of Snow White, not all of the other stuff that has come down to us. So that's the time we have today to look at these uh, sampling poems or how I go into a poem, choose a poem because it has any number of interesting word choices and or tropes that are used that can be spotted and I can create a question out of which uh, comes one answer that, um, that uh, rest in among a number of distractors. Let me give you a clue on something real quick. If among the answers, the distractors and the correct answer, you have synecdoche and metonymy, please know it's neither one. Those are too close for a student or myself or anybody else sometimes to pull apart. If they are very closely related tropes, it's probably that they're both distractors. If Plosi and Polypiton are in the same bank of answers, it's, it's not gonna be Plosi or Polypiton. I would not ask you to make that decision. I will probably never ask you to make a distinction between assonance and alliteration because assonance is a form of alliteration. Alliteration is a repetition of sounds. Assonance is a repetition of initial vowel sounds. So alliteration, uh, excuse me, assonance is a subset of alliteration and I try to stay away from that one also. So Friday we'll pick up with the ones that I haven't covered today. And I'll look over that list and make sure I have transumption and home teleton on it. And if anybody has a poem he or she wishes I play with, Come Friday, send it so I can get it up on the web uh, by, by, uh, by way of uh, David and Glenda. Thank you all very much. Uh, now I take questions. Thank you for the email address, David. I've retired of late. And so if you've come across an old email address, I think I've cleared it up everywhere. I'm not too sure, but that's the one I use now. Thank you, Angie. Good to see you again. Hello to the kids. I mean, the young adults. Great. We don't have any questions. We're going to stop recording. Thank you, Mark, for your uh, information.